high among the world's mightiest mountains, up near the everlasting snows in the heart of Asia, the ways of man are as rich as they are old in the tapestry of his evolution. Here in the shadows of such lofty heights as Mount Everest and Annapurna, he peacefully pursues the business of staying alive with tolerance and patience, as he has always done down through the centuries. Set aside in a corner of the globe little known to modern man, the kingdom of Nepal is a small country. It lies 100 miles deep in the Himalaya mountains. Its northern border stretches 500 rugged and impassable miles along the Great White Barrier and Tibet. To the east, west, and to the south, the whole of India sweeps down to the trade centers of Asia and the outer world. Dwarfed by the majesty of the towering peaks, the cradled valleys and terraced hillsides support life as they have always done. In a land where, by its very remoteness, the simple value of the wheel is still unknown to many. nature demands the utmost for Bible. Nine out of ten people must work on the land. For food is scarce, and there is little left for sale or barter. The soil is tilled with age-old tools, and the time-worn custom of a neighbor's help is well established, and can be relied upon with confidence. It has often been said that if the monsoon rains could be held on the land, three and even four crops a year might be harvested. For the climate is moderate, and wheat, rice, millet, potatoes, corn, and even tomatoes ripen readily all year round. Rich yields of healthy grain stored in your own backyard or winnowed in the open bring a satisfying sense of security. Many hands make light labor and add a note of celebration, too. A passing minstrel who sings the news is welcome at any household, and his cheery interpretations of the ancient legends honor the gods and express the gratitude which all must feel at times like these. <laughs> Amid this mountain splendor, Gautama Buddha was born 2,500 years ago, near the southwest of wonders nature. The Buddha's birthplace was enshrined and preserved by his followers. Time-worn trails still bear evidence of ancient pilgrims who, with loving care, erected shrines and stupas throughout the country for the veneration of Buddha. Now, as of old, a tolling bell, a streaming prayer flag, or a turning prayer wheel suggests the measure of a man's devotion to his religion.
in temples of their faith, ceremonial offerings of sacred rice, sweetmeats, and a thousand lights, all blessed by the Chena Lama. These are cherished and memorable occasions. From the south and India, as ties grew stronger, visitors from these lands came and brought their culture. Their religion was Hinduism. One god was Vishnu. They too, with painstaking artistry, constructed temples and the images of their gods. Side by side with the Buddhist shrines, Hindu temples of worship began to appear. And with great patience, the Nepalese accepted and took as their own a blend of both faiths. Retained and held in holy reverence throughout the years, the sleeping image of Vishnu still receives a steady stream of dedicated followers who worship at his feet. Priests intone their offerings in prayers, with sacred rice thrown into the flames of a sacred fire. This is a good time, too, to fix the station of your life on your forehead in the proper Hindu fashion. To bathe in the Bhagmati River by the steps of Pashupati Temple cleans the soul as well as the body and honors the god Shiva, the destroyer, who cares for the dead after cremation in this holy place. Today one marvels at the number and beauty of the shrines and temples that dot the countryside and villages. Each in itself, by its architecture, records the turning pages of time. Not forgotten either are the delicate arts and crafts of other years. Carvings in wood immortalize the gods. and they beautify the home as well. Intricate metal work, fashioned by skilled and expert fingers, display attractive local stones, 
in the royal manner. Midway between the lowland Terai and the high Himalayas at the narrowest portion of Nepal is the capital city of Kathmandu. Lying in the center of one of Nepal's largest and most fertile valleys, once a mile high lake, Kathmandu is a city of statues and palaces, which remain as testimonials to the reign of the Rana Maharajas, who held the country bound securely and ruled for one full century. Honored and decorated for their courageous soldiery, the Gurkha regiments of the Nepal Army fought on the battlefields of World War I and II. Bang! Cha! Three by the left! Bang! March! Returning home from the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, they ably supported a progressive group with new ideals. In 1951, the hold of the Ranas was dislodged, and the officers of the hereditary king were reinstated to full power. <laughs> Today, His Royal Majesty King Mahendra Bir Bikrama Shahadeva and His Gracious and Beautiful Queen Ratma Raja Lakshmi devote themselves to the affairs of state with a direct simplicity that invites the cordial cooperation of all their people. In his office, His Majesty looks to the well-being of his people with a seriousness that recognizes the problems that face his small nation. By initiating Nepal's first five-year plan, he launches a well-thought-out program for the substantial progress of his country. To breach the gap of many backward years, the friendly countries of the world extend their technical assistance and financial aid. In turn, the Nepalese must coordinate the projects harmoniously to avoid duplication of their valuable services. In the field of education, long neglected and once a luxury reserved for only the male members of the wealthy families, Schools today are overcrowded and unable to meet even a small portion of the demands of an ever-increasing number of young men and women. Tri Chandra College, although considered the best in Nepal, struggles desperately to maintain standards with their limited facilities. Realizing that the future prosperity of the country rests with the knowledgeable training of its young people, the government faces the fact that new universities alone are not enough. Illiteracy, rated a staggering 98%, dictates the need for an immediate reorganization of its entire school system. With women's rights more fully established, young women in greater numbers too now look forward to a full education and face it with determination. Will you just continue reading the second paragraph, Chapler? That it required much greater talents to fill up and become a retired life than a life of business. Upon this occasion, he rallied very agreeably the busy men of the age who very valued, who only valued themselves for being in motion and passing through a series of trifling insignificant actions. It's very good, you see, now, will you just read the third paragraph? My friend's talk made so odd an impression upon my mind that soon after I was in bed, I fell insensibly into a most unaccountable reverie that had neither moral nor design in it and, I, and can't we so properly call a dream as a delirium. Yes. Scholarship students returning home from the United States trained in organizing efficient programs in education, will spearhead the drive against illiteracy. Supported by funds and assistance from the United States Operations Mission, over 300 schools have been set up in rural areas. 
The need for teachers to man these schools is an immediate problem. In open seminars at the teacher's training center, problems are discussed freely so that all may realize their full responsibilities in the job ahead. Rural areas are given first consideration, where the difficult terrain interferes with supervised control and it is impossible for the teachers there to attend the Kathmandu training center. Special units, equipped with the latest teaching methods, will visit the areas regularly. Alphabets and corrective readers, once unavailable, will now be supplied in sufficient quantities. For books are now becoming a necessary part of the younger generation's daily life. classes designed to help the women of the villages, girls selected for their qualities of leadership are brought to the Kathmandu Home Economics Boarding School. Here, helpful hints in better home management, proper foods, and such things as the design and operation of the smokeless chula stoves are demonstrated in detail and are gratefully received. Of pressing importance, too, in this changing land is the health of the people. Modern clinics, still all too few, look to the personal needs of those who feel they urgently require their services. To combat the scourge of TB, X-ray equipment, though limited, is made available to all within its area. <laughs> Nepalese doctors work side by side with foreign specialists. As the momentum of progressive ways increases, the present generation of elders is given equal consideration in the government's plan for adult education. Where in the comfort of a man's own home, surrounded by his family, by radio, He may enjoy the best of Nepalese culture, presented by competent artists. <laughs>
sports activities, also encouraged and played on the Tundikal of Kathmandu, are entered into with healthy enthusiasm. Games such as cricket, badminton, tennis and ping pong are most popular. In the streets of Kathmandu, automobiles, bicycles and traffic policemen are now becoming a common sight. Motion pictures advertised in a modern manner show the latest films from India, the United States and Europe. As the trend toward modern ways continues, the demand for imported articles, supplies and necessities increases. Nepal's main artery of supply comes through India to the Low Terai, where from Simara and Bimpedi, it must span mountain peaks for 13 miles to Kathmandu. A slow and difficult process from Nepalese railhead at Amlakgenj truck to the ropeway terminal at Bimpedi, then at the rate of eight tons per hour, it sweeps across the mountaintops by ropeway to Kathmandu to meet the demands of a growing civilization. <laughs> to ease this ancient problem, new ropeways are planned. And to clear a way through the mountainous 13 miles, 90 miles of twisting, turning roadway have been built under the supervision of Indian engineers. As new roads are planned for other areas as well, Nepal's many rushing streams and mountain rivers, once made accessible, can supply vast quantities of hydroelectric power. Present day facilities are old and the limited supply of electricity is badly overloaded. With transportation the key to many of their development programs, much attention is given to the successful operation of their airlines. For passengers as well as freight, Indian National Airways now keep the skyways open with two flights a day, five days a week, with air freight rates the lowest in the world. Airfields at Pokhara, Barawa, Simara, and Bharatnagar link Kathmandu with all the major cities. Now flights are made within the hour to spots that took a week to reach in the old way by foot. Such time saving devices are greatly appreciated by the Nepalese, who take to it gracefully as if they had always done it. In Bharatnagar, as transportation systems improve, the Nepalese government now looks with greater interest to its cash crops. Jute, which grows well in the monsoon flooded areas of the southeastern region, is cultivated in limited quantity. With modern development, will become a profitable export crop. Sugarcane fields, long neglected and badly in need of revitalization, are capable of producing a high quality of cane sugar and can also meet the demands of some foreign markets. But well does the Nepalese government realize that all this is not enough, that the remote areas of its country still remain apart and undeveloped. Whole regions of badly needed fertile lands lie useless and unattended in mosquito and animal infested valleys of the Low Terai.
to reach the people of all Nepal, the government has placed as top priority the problem of village development. Such areas as the Rapti Valley, once open for settlement and cultivation, will soon become a productive part of Nepalese economy. Running the full length of the valley, a road is planned, which will join the isolated areas in an unbroken line of farms and villages. To assure the settlers moving here a way of life that has a future, a well-organized program is now in effect with development stages plotted in their proper order. Beginning now, stockpiled items such as pumps and plowshares, in sufficient number to be available to all, are being readied for distribution. The pumps will furnish clean, uncontaminated water, and the plowshares of steel will add a touch of modernism. Combating the dreaded malaria-carrying mosquito, rated the number one killer of Nepal, has always been the battle of the people in the Lo Terai. Their defenses were limited to seasonal evacuations or to shunning the areas completely. Now, malaria teams trained by U.S. and world health specialists have cleared the entire Rapti Valley. Systematic checks throughout the year will keep it clear as spraying continues whenever necessary. To build a home, you must have lumber. First-class pokka houses are planned for all who settle here. The high potential of Nepal's forest areas can supply more than just the needs of the immediate area. Hardwoods rated among the world's finest are readily available. Mobile sawmill units follow the progressive march down through the valley, supplying cut lumber from sturdy logs as the demand arises. As each phase of the program develops, training in mechanical skills keeps pace. The knowledge to maintain and service the valuable machinery must be learned with patience through participation and observation. Welding, always a constant necessity where construction work is in progress, keeps the valuable bulldozers on the job and ensures their continued serviceability. Blasting away through the stubborn ridges is always a pleasant step in an operation such as the Rafti Road. At every turn and with every cut through, the bulldozer's blade uncovers rich loam, which runs to depths of six and eight feet. And sweeping before the road, the promise of the land is well confirmed by the views of lush and peaceful acreages. Where the rains rushed away in floods to the plains below, they have harnessed the waters and built a dam. Now under control, the placid waters will extend the growing period. Rationed with care, larger tracts of land can now be put in cultivation with modern machinery in experimental farms. And to those who have established themselves on the land, this progress means a kind of independence in which the individual may live his life in his own way, assured that tomorrow will not become a nightmare of starvation and hopeless wandering. And where lives depend upon the seasons, additional water brings relief in many ways. With proper flow, wells that once ran dry 
now have a stable quantity of water and justify concrete surfacing in the approved sanitary manner. With every phase of government responsibility analyzed and detailed for improvement and encouraged by the cooperation of the people, His Majesty looks with confidence to a bright future for Nepal. Honored by the countries of the world as a member of the United Nations, respected and admired, Nepal's delegates now take their just positions in the affairs of the world. Where, like all men in the free world, their equal rights will be fully honored by the men and women of other nations. आगे प्यारा प्रजा हरु के अथूचित आज इस नया वर्ष को पहलो सुबह दिन में सभी देशवासी हरु लाई हर तरह बात सुख शांति लब्ध हो सकने हार्दिक कामना सुनाओ न पाऊं दा हमें लाई ज्यादा खुशी लाए कुछ आ इस नव वर्ष प्रारंभ में सभी ले आपनों दिल बात व्यक्तिगत तथा बर्गीय स्वास्थ्य पंचाई निस्वास्थ्य देश सेवा को सत्कारी मार लागन सकुन यही हमरू आंतरिक अभिलाषा र कामनांश है जय नेपाल